So the five poems that make up Jail Me Quickly were published in New World Fortnightly in um, several issues over 1964, and then they were published again as a full sequence in 1966. I think thinking about how the poems were published is really important for us. It can open up the poems for us in different kinds of ways. And for Carter, this was a period of comparative silence, although he was writing and publishing throughout the 1960s. And I think what we find is a writer who is still committed to poetry, but is also wary of its uses. In many ways with Carter, it is friendships that occasion publication, and this was no different. He and the younger David de Carey's got to know each other in the 1960s, and at the end of 1964, Carter offered these five poems to um, David de Carey's and Miles Fitzpatrick, who also edited New World Fortnightly. It was a simply produced publication, I'd say, with each copy running to about 30 pages or so. And the goal of the magazine was to offer a forum for political discussion, cultural debate that was non-partisan, but which interrogated the idea of a post-colonial Guyana, a post-colonial future for the Caribbean. When David de Carey's um, received these poems, he told me that he wasn't able to pay Carter and Carter didn't ask for any payment either. He said this, this fabulous series of poems were given to us. We were a struggling little magazine publishing four, five, six hundred copies at best, and this recognised poet gave us these poems. David de Carey's excitement, I think, is really understandable. The poems constitute an excoriating and empathetic document of Guyana in the 1960s, and I think they also represent some of Carter's most exacting poetic exercises. So the poems are a product of a very particular Guyanese context and Carter chose to publish them in a Guyanese publication, but it was a forum that was reaching out to the wider Caribbean. And this is what Brian Meeks says about the New World movement. He says, New World still remains the most ambitious attempt to build a post-colonial pan-Caribbean movement of radical intellectuals. At its apogee in the mid to late 60s, in addition to the two journals at either end of the region, New World had flourishing discussion groups throughout most of the territories of the archipelago, including Puerto Rico. There were also important chapters in the United States and Canada, and wherever young thinking Caribbean people met, the journal and its contents were bases for both discussion and organization. So New World Fortnightly is part of a searching and unifying collective. And I think it's important to remember that this is where Carter chose to place these poems. The poems were published in three consecutive editions of the magazine. The first pair of poems, Black Friday 1962 and After One Year, were published in the second issue of the magazine with a very brief editorial note that just said this, Martin, Mr. Carter, has given us several poems under the general title, Jail Me Quickly. In this issue, we published the first two. What Can a Man Do More was published without editorial comment in the third issue. And the final poems of, um, the final pair of poems, Where a Free Man and Childhood, Childhood of a Voice were published in the fourth issue. The editors of New World Fortnightly published these poems again in 1966, and this time with an introduction by Ian MacDonald. Many people, I think, remember Carter's poetry being recited on streets during the emergency in the 1950s, but so much more of Carter's work has entered a public vocabulary, and the poems in Jail Me Quickly have come to represent a major document in Guyanese political and literary history. Ian MacDonald in 1966 anticipates, I think, the importance of these poems. He wrote this, politicians will read Martin Carter's Jail Me Quickly for the politics in it. Social reformers will read these five fierce poems for the scathing indictment of a society. Historians will treasure them for the vivid and terrible enactment of a time of national tragedy. Psychologists will read them and draw their intricate picture of a complex, original, angry, deeply cynical man. We can also get a sense of Carter's concerns in his own voice in this period. 
in the first issue of New World Fortnightly, he wrote an open letter. And in it, he wrote this. Life in a country as materialistic and philistine as BG soon blunts the edge of the mind. The almost fanatical preoccupation with hollow issues, the gossip mongering which passes for conversation and the inevitable political hysteria leave little time for the serious examination of ideas. I know that the psychological squalor of everyday life is exhausting. I know that the urgent practical problem of making a living comes first. What I do not know is why so few revolt, either by word or by deed, against such acute spiritual discomfort. As he continues, Carter welcomes the contribution of New World Fortnightly, thinking about how it can question materialism and philistinism as he sees it. And notice it is BG that Carter talks about here, not the liberating Guyana that he names into a dead slave. Carter is interested in reminding us that he understands the burden of everyday life. I know, he says, I know, but his words are also really demanding and logically searching. Why do we, he is asking us, why do we undervalue or even hate the knowledge that we gain through the arts, through spirituality? Because this is what Philistinism means. In Carter's reckoning, everyday living doesn't preclude revolt. The two states aren't incompatible for him. And I'd even say that Carter's incomprehension seems to arise from the fact that he views these states as actually being causally linked. When we look at Jeremy quickly, it is possible to argue that Carter gives us a kind of performance of all those issues that he's talking about in his open letter. Can the five poems be read as a guide for people to regain revolutionary fervor? Or are they a document of disappointment? I think it's possible that they can be both, they can be all these things. And it's also helpful to remember that other challenge that Carter thinks about in his open letter, the challenge of the poems that might be more open, but equally demanding. These poems are examples of Carter's call for the serious examination of ideas. And so we have to reckon with all that follows from this kind of dedication. separate the event of Black Friday 1962 and the poem Black Friday 1962. And we don't know when Carter wrote this poem, but we can say that it was only in 1964 that he considered it ready for public readership. Noting the time lag between the event and the publication, I think is important because it points to a distance that maybe should be marked between the real world events and this textual event that we read. Carter offers no authorial notes to the poems, and I think he gave none during his career. And it is easy, I think, to describe these poems as historical, political, social, psychological, in the way that Ian MacDonald says. And I think we also would maybe want to add to that and to say that these poems, the poems in Jeremy Quickly and Black Friday 1962, are poems about ideas as well ideas about what political action is, about what being a citizen involves. And Black Friday 1962 might seem like a poem reported from the front line, but I think we need to remember that it had been two years in the making. Those opening lines of Parisian present us with an abstraction in some respects of political mobilization. 
And they also testify to the physical motion involved in revolt, in revolution, in riot. The words were some who are repeated four times. And within the repetition, Carter marks the conflicts and the inconsistencies of revolution. We quickly notice as we read the poem that the directions in which each run are opposed. And yet the poet claims to be with them all, a gesture that suggests he's in the midst of the events, but it's also maybe an impossible statement of allegiance. The phrases, a city of men, a fated day, the glowing red morning sky, certainly all suggest the glory of revolution. But Carter's figurative language forces us to question our idea of revolution as well. If the sky glows red like glory, what kind of glory has been achieved here? Grace Nichols' novel about this period also draws on the power and ambiguities of Carter's language. The novel is called Whole of a Morning Sky. And we wonder what does that phrase mean? And that sense of openness, I think, is really important in this poem. There's a kind of frenzy of word association in the lines. Words are twinned and linked together in complex ways. Obsession, for example, appears in the same line as celebration, and celebration is clarified as swearing. You could say that the revolutionary fist that we see in earlier poems is now reconfigured as a kind of phallic gesture. And this image of swearing hovers between maybe the freedoms of Bacchanal and also the ancient forms of swearing an oath. So swearing here becomes committed to telling the truth. But telling the truth of this moment in these lines of poetry is really hard. And like the opening of the poem, Carter pulls us in different kinds of directions. And he's constantly making a very demanding kind of language for us here to understand the actions that are taking place in his city. He draws together the West Indian proverbial image of the crab clawing its way to the top of the barrel. And he puts that together with classical motifs of citizenship and the ritual possession of Roman triumphs. There are echoes of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar here, working within a poetic language that's drawing its power from Creole speech. So where do we end up at the close of this poem? In this poetic Black Friday 1962, the triumphal procession of citizens is like this to the speaker. He says, always for me the same vision of cemeteries, slow funerals, broken tombs, and death designing all. So a city of clerks has been transformed this day into a city of men. And this remains a really powerful metaphor for thinking about post-colonial transformation. But in Carter's poetic vision, citizenship is seen as demanding, as difficult, as dangerous, as deadly even to achieve. Black Friday, 1962 by Martin Carter. Were some who ran one way, were some who ran another way, were some who did not run at all. Were some who will not run again. And I was with them all when the sun and streets exploded and a city of clerks turned a city of men. It was a day that had to come ever since the whole of a morning sky glowed red like glory over the tops of houses. I would never have believed it. I would have made a telling repudiation, but I saw it myself, and here was a mass of fire. So now, obsessed, I celebrate in words all origins of creation, whores and virgins. I do it with a hand upon a groin, swearing this way, since other ways are false. For there's only one way, one path, one road, and nothing downward bent. But upward goes like leaves to sun, like trees to the sun itself. All, all who are human fail like bullets aimed at life or the dead who shoot 
and think themselves allies. Behind a wall of stone beside this city, mud is blue gray when ocean waves are gone in the midday sun. And I have seen some creatures rise from holes and claw a triumph like a citizen and reign until the tide. Atop the iron rooftops of the city, I see the vultures practicing to wait. And every time and any time in sleep or sudden wake, nightmare dream, always for me the same vision of cemeteries, slow funerals, broken tombs, and death designing all. True, was with them all and told them more than once. In despair, there is but there is none in death. Now, I repeat it here, feeling a waste of life in a marketplace of doom, watching the human face. <laughs> After One Year is the companion poem to Black Friday 1962, and we might date its composition to at some point in 1963, because that assumes that Carter in this poem is responding to the event of Black Friday 1962. But as ever with Carter, there's no single reading, and what at first might seem precise starts to feel open to interpretation. The first line is a question. After today, how shall I speak with you? But we never learn what happened today to, to occasion this question. And how does this day relate to what happened one year ago? Reminiscent of the vocabulary of revolution that Carter exploits in the early poem, Do Not Stare at Me, Carter recreates this city as a potential center for social change. However, whereas he claims is right, to write the topographies of his city and do not stare at me. He says, born in this city was I lady. In these companion poems, it's not really his narrative position in the city that's contestable, but how language can be positioned to make sense of the events. One thing to consider is how Carter experiments in this poem with the limits of the iambic pentameter. He seeks to write, I think, within and outside the form of poetry that this offers. So we might think about the poet's hyperbolic plea. So jail me quickly, clang the illiterate door, if freedom writes no happier alphabet. And this is a striking example of iambic pentameter. It could be, so jail me quickly, clang the illiterate door, if freedom writes no happier alphabet. So that kind of meter gives the lines a sort of structural shape, but they can actually be voiced in innumerable ways with different kinds of stresses. And there is also punctuation to consider with these two lines. The break after jail me quickly emphasizes the rhetorical flourish of the imperative and prepares us for that even more forceful imperative that's written after the sussura, after the break, clang the illiterate door. The line suggests that the promise of revolutionary vocabulary is spent. However, Carter introduces conditionality into the poem. So although the line ends with finality, shut the door, the phrasal movement leads us to the next line and to Carter's slim hope. Freedom's happier alphabet is dependent on this lowercase if, and it's a really fragile conditionality. And Carter, I think, is exploiting the lines to create this tension between hope and despair. And the conditional if there is the hinge on which he balances this tension. This kind of conditional statement, I think, epitomizes Carter's poetic style during this period. The concerns of the earlier poetry, freedom, independence, the importance of new poetic vocabularies, poetic grammars are still present. But there's a kind of complication of expression that starkly exposes Carter's mordant humour and searing concern. 
At times, it seems like Carter would adopt a derisive pose in private life, in his public identity and his poetic persona. On other occasions, it seems like hopefulness or solidarity are coming to the fore. In this poem, the speaker condemns the rude citizen, asserting that he knows how the world works. And these words and ideas remain relevant to us. In a recent letter to the Stabrook News, the writer Gary Gidhari tells a story of his friend misquoting the lines of this poem. The friend remembers it as something like, men kill men as men kill men to prop the government. So the idea is there, but not the shape of the poem. And the lines are, men murder men as men must murder men to build their shining governments of the damned. Between the misquotation and these lines, I think we can start to understand more the power of Carter's poetry. We can hear what alliteration does to sharpen the awfulness of this realization. We can hear how these lines are also maybe contained with an iambic pentameter, but aren't limited by it. We can also hear how figurative language, the shining governments of the damned, forces us to try to make sense of brutal, greedy, senseless action. After today, how shall I speak with you? Those miseries I know you cultivate are mine, as well as yours. Or do you think the impartial bullock cares whose land is ploughed? I know this city much as well as you do. The ways leading to the brothels and those dooms dwelling in them, as in our lives they dwell. So, jail me quickly. Clang the illiterate door if freedom writes no happier alphabet. The old hanging ground is still green playing field and smooth cemetery, proud garden of tall flowers. But in your secret gables, real bats fly, mocking great dreams that give the soul no peace and everywhere. Wrong deeds are being done. Rude citizen, think you I do not know that love is stammered, hate is shouted out in every human city in this world? Men murder men, as men must murder men to build their shining governments of the damned. The poet Vivek Narayanan has described Carter's, what he says, as willingness to make politics answerable to the lyric vision. And this kind of answerability, I think, is so important to Martin Carter's poetry. How can politics achieve the same kind of emotional truthfulness that the eye of lyric poetry attempts to achieve? In part, answerability is about testing politics to make sure it's living up to its own language, but it's also about establishing lyrical language as a foundational part of life. We don't understand these poems in Jail Me Quickly just by knowing their politics, but also by respecting them as poems that are creating a living language. The idea of lyric vision I think also helps us to understand some of the repeated masculine perspective that Carter pursues in this poem and in others. We might be tempted to read here that man is equivalent to human in this poem and in Jail Me Quickly, but I think there's something really importantly gendered about the world he is investigating here. And this includes, I think, the speaker's complicity in it as a man and all that this might imply. In this poem, the thing that a man can do more is a beautifully tender, but really devastating action. Listen to these lines about how he wants to dwell beside a flowering tree and pick the blossoms if he fears the fruit will fall like hatred to insult the earth. 
So here the speaker is a, cust a custodian of the earth and note that if again, so conditionality once again is so important in this poem as it was in the poem after one year. We move from a sense of a man being in symbiotic relation with the earth to the realization that the picking of the blossoms here might be all he can do to prevent the bitter fruit of hate that is also equally part of the earth. On one reading of the poem, the experience of men is centered, but this poem I think also reaches away from that experience. The opening of the poem and the ending of the poem contain the apostrophes, O oh, rain and fire, O oh, rust and smoke. And these are archaic forms of address that are conventionally used to kind of direct attention to inanimate or abstract or um, absent people. And Carter uses them quite a lot in his work as Vanni Capaldeo has explored in their collection, Venus as a Bear. Apostrophe can take the form of lament or prayer. It might harness energy or call for aid or inspiration or protection. And here Carter gives these apostrophes a kind of contemporary power and also taps into their archaic resonances. Rain and fire and their twinned consequences, rust and smoke embody hopeful beginnings and disappointing endings. Listen out also for the you that is unexpectedly, I think, introduced in the penultimate stanza. And this is a gender-free you who is the speaker's companion. The you in the poem could be rain and fire, that could be the, the kind of the category that's being addressed here, or it might be someone else. Whoever it is, this other addressed figure reconfigures the poem. All the assumptions that we might have had about the solitary powers and the pain of this man have to shift for us. And it's shared actions of care that are emphasized, searching, weeping, living together. What Can a Man Do More? by Martin Carter. Oh, rain and fire, hopeful origins. Oh, rust and smoke, only enduring end. I almost stumble underneath the waste while squandered daylight mocks my deep remorse for seeds that rot, for interrupted love and hours spent digging hopes out of a grave. From birth to death, what can a man do more than want to dwell beside the flowering tree and pick the blossoms if he fears the fruit will fall like hatred to insult the earth. And how to leave these sharp entanglements or scour this village of the angry streets. How utter truth when falsehood is the truth. How welcome dreams, how flee the newest lie. With you, I search through nights of frightened stars and weep by gateways of the bleeding houses. With you, I stay to offer up to time the sacrifice this God demands of us. All oh, rain and fire, hopeful origins, all oh, rust and smoke, only enduring and so where are free men begins with another apostrophe but in this poem it's used more as lament rather than invocation oh we have endured such absurd times it's worth thinking about i think this idea of the absurd in the poem we might remember Karl Marx's famous statement where he writes, Hegel remarks somewhere that all great world historical facts and personages occur as it were twice. He has forgotten to add the first time as tragedy, the second as farce. David de Carey's, I think, can help us understand something of the period and this sense of absurd historical repetition. This is David de Carey's talking about Martin Carter. I would hear him teasing other people. 
if you came back from England, let us say, with a reputation of being a member of the Communist Party or something of that kind, and he met you, he would say, have you thawed out yet? And then if you made the mistake of saying you hadn't, he would look at Keith Carter and say, can't help it, a young boy you know, you don't know better. Pouring scorn on idealism, but sort of tongue in cheek, but yet, but yet not really, if you know what I mean. There was at that time a bantering air about him, which was comic, but not really comic, if you know what I mean. He just became against failure. I don't think he thought a solution was possible, but the underlying theme was a bitterness at failure. I think Carter's humour is directed at himself as much as others. The things he derides others for, such as communist beliefs, or positions that he once adhered to, or conditions that they all share, such as having been born in Guyana. If Carter felt it was necessary to pour scorn on idealism, this scorn feels shared. All are part of the wider failures, for example, say, if we're thinking about the politics of the period, the failures of the independence movement, the continued colonial condition of Guyana. De Carey's describes this pattern of behavior as a kind of nonsense, and perhaps the Carter brothers did hone a particular brand of Guyanese absurdism. This poem is certainly interested in challenging ideas about meaning and purpose. Why are the we in the poem waiting? Why have their wings had no rest? Birds in Carter's early work are clear symbols of hope, but there is no kind eagle in this poem to soar and wheel in flight. And the final line is an exclamation an expression of disbelief at the failure of the times. Our prison of air is worse than one of iron. Where are free men by Martin Carter? Oh, we have endured such absurd times and have waited so long, so weary with time. Over the city, our souls will fly like birds, crying in the night. There will be wild cries in the still night. Over the city, they will sound like the cries of ghosts of homeless birds. Flying to the forest, flying from the sea. And what in dreams we do, in life we attend. But where are free men? Where the endless streets? Since we were born, our wings have had no rest. Our prison of air is worse than one of iron. In Poems of Resistance from British Guyana, Carter uses conditional statements quite a lot. And here they're quite outspoken and almost throw off their conditionality. In letter one, he writes, if I do not live to see that day, my son will see it. Carter suggests that the conditional status of revolution will finally be overcome, will be made certain through the convictions and the actions of him and his comrades. In Childhood of a Voice, Carter uses the phrase, if only, a phrase that I think we use when we want to express a wish or talk about something we wish was true. And I think this is important in this poem. It links to the poetics of conditionality that crosses the poems in Jail Me Quickly. And it's also maybe a phrase that challenges some of the absurdism that drives the poem. The speaker styles himself as someone who never cared at all. But this is a poem of contrasts and contradictions. And it actually feels like there is care everywhere in this poem. Imagine it. The, the speaker commands 
and that's followed by a complex reverse set of images about voices and childhoods that can give meaning to the speaker by telling him his name. It turns out, as we read this final poem, that to become a city of men is not enough for revolution. And in this poem, it seems that there is no way to re-enchant the world. Carter writes, even the round earth is tired of being round and spinning round the sun. And it might feel like this is a devastating place to end this series of poems. It's a very different kind of revolution. The earth revolves, but nothing changes. But the final lines of a poem are not necessarily the final ideas for us to be thinking about when we read Carter's poetry. The phrases imagine it and if only are still present in the poem and the command to imagine and the wish to think of a different future remain even as we read those final lines. So the world and the lives that we live in it might feel absurd, might be absurd or meaningless, but planted in this poem is another kind of meaning making. Jail me quickly is one command given in this series of poems. Imagine it is another, summoning for us the creative powers of the mind. Childhood of a Voice by Martin Carter. <clears throat> The light oppresses and the darkness frees a man like me who never cared at all. Imagine it, the childhood of a voice and the voice of childhood telling me my name. But if only the rain would fall and the sky we have not seen so long come blue again. The familiar white street is tired of always running east. The sky of always arcing over. The tree of always reaching up. Even the round earth is tired of being round and spinning round the sun. <laughs> <laughs>